Hi guys, welcome to Twin Peaks, Twin Perspective. I'm Joe. I'm James. And tonight we are going to be... <laughs> Josie! Hey Josie, you got burned! Tonight we're going to be reviewing and recapping, we think, Twin Peaks The Return, Part 14, We Are Like the Dreamer. Full spoilers on everything Twin Peaks. Brother James, what did you think about part 14 of The Return? We are like the dreamer. We are like the dreamer? I loved it. 10 out of 10. Lynch languishing where he needed to languish. He didn't do give us a four minute French chick. He didn't give us a two minute sweep scene. Um... Slow stories here and there. Everything was everything was beautiful in my mind. It was a, a surreal, as surreal as I wanted. I want my I want my Twin Peaks Lynchian. Every everything just I can't wait to get into it. Okay. What did you give it? I'm giving it a ten out of ten. Pretty good. Uh, the uh, imagery will stay with me for some of them scenes for quite a while. A lot of people are calling it a game-changing hour for Twin Peaks. I'm not sure I would go there just yet. And we're talking about Sarah here. But, uh, hmm. 10 out of 10, great episode. I wish uh, more of them were like this, for sure. So, you ready to jump into it? Ready to jump into it. All right, let's get it on. We, of course, with lots of episodes of Twin Peaks, we start in Buckhorn, South Dakota. Uh, we're at the Mayfair Hotel, and uh, we see uh, Director Cole, and he's making a phone call. He's returning a call from Sheriff Truman. Lucy answers the phone. There's this great scene with Cole screaming and Lucy... And we've got the times are together now. Oh, well, yeah. Thank South you. Dakota and Twin Peaks, they go on beyond. <laughs> All you calendar makers out there, mark this one on the same day. So, uh, when Cole gets on the phone with Truman, he realizes it's not Harry, it's Frank. And then uh, Cole finds out Harry's sick, and what they say, he's uh, in doctor's care. That's what Frank says. Harry's in doctor's care. Which, of course, leaves that door wide open like normal. I'm sick. Do you think he's suffering? Do you think Harry's suffering from the evil and having to investigate all this stuff over the years and it's done something to his psyche and therefore this this help by a doctor is, is some, for some emotional breakdown or mental breakdown? Or do you think that it's something like cancer or some kind of disease that he's fighting? I think it's some kind of cancer, but I'd love to see him in the same psych ward as Audrey when we get a little step into his room. But, you know, maybe Evil Coop puked up some Garmin Bozzi on Harry's face before he left, and it just, you never know, hit it in like a, a bonsai tree. Puked up my shoes! <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's some possibilities there. Of course, all it's that kind of radiation is. poisoning right. of some sort. It feels that's what it feels right to me. Mm -hmm. And they also say some people they get in contact with Mr. C get sick. And they had them all quarantined off, but we've seen them around multiple people lately that haven't been getting sick. Maybe only the pure goodies feel ill around Mr. C because the farm. Those guys, none of them are puking or anything. He, he, Mr. C, instead of punching Renzo, he could have just puked all over his face. It would have been like acid shot from an alien food or something. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, we're actually we're actually talking about uh, Truman's lack of information to Cole. Now, Truman tells Cole, we found something. We found missing pages from Laura's diary. Uh, which seem to indicate there may be two Coopers. And then Cole immediately says, we can't talk about this any further, but thank you very much for this information. And now Sheriff Truman acted like that was all he knew. So we could be dealing with a, a moment in time where all they had at this moment was the pages 
They still hadn't acquired the key to the room. They still hadn't acquired the tube for Major Briggs and knew that they were going to this place, which they might have wanted the key the FBI in on. Uh, so... Yeah, just it felt really left out. Or and Lynch right. does it. He did it later with the. Um, but we'll talk about what he does, leave, leaving out information and makes it harder for somebody to find the answers. When it's like all you had to do was share more information, and he would have been on the first plane to Twin Peaks. Oh yeah, the Joneses. That's right. So yeah, yeah. we'll talk about it later. But just like you said, I think that now, and I didn't think about it at the time, but I really do believe that we're looking at a moment that happened earlier in right. the season. Right. But the FBI, almost everything they've done was up to this point in this from the, to this in this phone conversation. It's, it's kind of crazy. So if this is in the past, the FBI's got a whole lot more to do to catch up. But anyway, yeah, we're not going to confuse with timelines. Lynch does that enough. There's lots of calendars <laughs> everywhere. I guess you can go to Reddit and see one. I saw saw it and I, didn't I saw it. it. Nah. Uh, but we're we're not going to really try to get too deep into that discussion with all that stuff. Yeah, it's kind of over now. We're coming to a head where we're all going to be on the same timeline, or at least the one we're watching. Because we'll talk about three of them later. Uh, yeah, this episode was really good, but it did it did open up a lot of questions. Um, Pure Lynch. Yeah, and he, if he's going to prove that he's being jerky with the timeline, then every time something like this happens, there's a lack of information. Truman doesn't give Coleman, Cole any of the information, all of the information, so it seems like, what are we doing? I mean, are they that bad at their job? You mean the writers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Josie, I know you don't like being blind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then we cut to another room. This is where Cole's about to join Tammy and Albert, but before Cole arrives, Tammy and Albert are having a discussion. Albert is telling Tammy about the first case, case number one, the one that started it all for the Blue Rose Task Force. Uh, a very young uh, Gordon Cole and Philip Jeffries were investigating this case. In Washington State. Olympia, Washington. This woman's name was Lois Duffy. And I guess she was wanted for murder. And they were outside of her hotel room. They heard shots from inside the room, so they kick the door in and there is two women there one of them had shot the other the woman that's dying from the gunshot wound to the abdomen says I am like the blue rose and then she smiles and then she dies and then she disappears right before the eyes of Cole and Jeffrey so this woman was Lois Duffy. They identified her as Lois Duffy. She just disappears. Then they look in the corner to see who had pulled the trigger, and lo and behold, it's Lois Duffy. <gasps> so, they, uh, I guess she's arrested for whatever crime they were seeking. They were going there to, Duffy for. they were going there to arrest her anyway. So, she's, right. she, evil Duffy must have pulled the trigger on somebody, and now she's getting arrested for it right because there's no body to confirm she just shot her own self or whatever so so anyway so lois duffy's awaiting trial or she's on trial she's in jail and she ends up hanging herself and i say evil duffy because i'm assuming a doppel duffy or manufactured duffy right right lois duffy that was on trial said she was innocent of the crime she was being charged with and then she hangs herself now this seems like something a Not like a woodsman move. No, I never had one. Yeah. She got, she committed suicide. Scanner. It was style. a very Harold Smith thing. <laughs> but I guess the descents into hell are too much for some people. And it's maddening. Well, Anyone that tries to watch Twin Peaks, says, watch Twin Peaks. And they're no, like, I, don't oh, I can't don't handle it. it. I don't, don't do it. it. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so. So uh, that was the original case, and they decided to call it Blue Rose Cases because Tammy shows she's ready to be a Blue Rose agent because she breaks this down for Albert the way he expects. The most important thing about it is the Blue Rose. What is it? Tammy breaks it down. It's unnatural. It doesn't happen in nature. So it's either conjured or, and the word I was thinking of was manufactured, but instead she says, what's the word she says? Oh, mon dieu. 
<laughs> oh no, a, I, I a, don't have it in my notes. A tulpa. A tulpa. I do a, have it in my notes. A tulpa. Beings create extra bodies to travel. That's oh, all I wrote. Right. Oh, okay. It, and that's a very, very short and loose translation. I thought you wrote the definition down. I didn't write the whole. I didn't write the Wikipedia definition down, but part of what tulpas do is they they create extra bodies to be able to maneuver, and that right. is where I think it's it it belongs in the Twin Peaks lore. Mm-hmm. I have to, you know, because like we have doppelgangers, we have yeah. Hawk says more than one spirit, but there are people believed in more than one spirit. And so, yeah, that's basically but these manufactured bodies, like a Dougie, and now I'm thinking like a low, well, like a Lois Duffy, like a Dougie, and probably like we're gonna meet someone else that's a manufactured before the end of the season. Hope it's not Diane. I hope it is Diane. I think everybody has a doppelganger. Everyone has a shadow side of themselves. And Hawk says we all have to go through the White Lodge and then we may encounter the Black Lodge if we have imperfect courage. And there we will meet our shadow self. It's just basically atoning for your sins. So uh, so this would be more manufactured then. But if a doppelganger exits the Lodge, you would think Per the return, the only way it can exist on Earth is if the real person is stuck in the lodge. So I wouldn't assume there were a ton of doppelgangers running around unless a person found a portal or vortex and entered and then the doppelganger came out. Now if this person found their way back out, they would have the same situation Cooper has with Mr. C. One of you must die. And it seems like this is what happened with this Lois Duffy. The Duffy incident. Yeah. Blue Rules case number one. So I'm going to go with Doppelganger. Everyone has a Doppelganger. Mir Tolpa. But this, but Dougie specifically, they say, <laughs> specifically they say manufactured. So you know, there's still an aura. There's still a mystery around Dougie. Douglas. So then, uh, yeah, she's Tammy looks great for Albert. Albert says, good job. And then Cole busts in and says, coffee time. We all love coffee. Yeah, <laughs> I want some coffee now. <laughs> I'm taking a sip of my coffee. And then there was that weird sound. The guy was cleaning the window. <laughs> and I thought this was just a, a funny thing, right? I mean, he's, I he's, thought it was going to last two minutes. He's fumbling with the, the volume adjustment, and we get to hear what he hears when somebody makes a sharp, squeaking noise like that. He always warns about it, and sure enough, it's feedback, and it's maddening. I had to turn the volume down on TV. <laughs> it's like, wow, poor Gordon. <laughs> but some people say that that was a code, that that thing was giving him a code. Oh, my. No, no. We, we do hear a sound similar to that later on in the episode when we are reintroduced to Nido. That's a, what I'm going to call her, Nido, the woman with no eyes. And there was a sound similar to the squeaking. But, uh, yeah, I think I think these codes are more sound designed than like I'm not going to zero and one this thing. I'm not going to binary any of this crap <laughs> right you're not going to measure the, the levels or, or the blinking lights in the window no no let some mathematician do that Lynch got a really good sound there and it works not only as a window cleaner but also as an alternate voice from a eyeless Asian woman I would I would take the window squeaking the squeegee over the laying on the horn any day oh yeah me too yeah it didn't languish it was just long enough for you to realize the poor guy's pain. Oh, shoot. That was great. But then finally, once he's able to adjust everything and he's able to talk, uh, he tells him that Diane's coming in. And... Yeah, Diane immediately comes in. He, well, yeah, Cole, and you Cole hear one little... <laughs> and Diane walks right. in. And then Diane walks in. And... Uh, Everyone's more accommodating to her this time around. Tammy brings her coffee. She's wearing clothes three days old. Yeah, she must have washed it. I'm <laughs> sure they could wash it. But but you look at the same day. Yeah, it could have been the same day she was wearing that green shirt. 
I don't know if you want to go back and do that or not. It was before they got the tube, sip the tube. It was before Harry knew, or Frank knew what to tell Gordon. Cole says, uh, make yourself at home. Tammy brings her the coffee. Enjoy some coffee. And, uh, and she replies by saying, a Deputy Diane reporting for duty. So the first thing they want to know is about her conversation with Cooper, the last conversation she had. And she said she didn't want to talk about it. So this goes back to Gordon, I'm going to tell you later. She doesn't want to say it in front of Albert and Tammy. Now, she's part of the team now. She's obstructing justice here because she's not telling them the information that they need to know. That's why you deputize a person. <laughs> so so uh, they figure, okay, well, the only thing we need you to answer is, did he ever mention Major Briggs? And Diane, in classic Diane style, says, fuck you, Gordon. And then she says, yes. So that's when Howard decides to describe the story about Major Briggs. And uh, we already knew it because we've seen it happen. But he just fills Diane in on the parts she didn't know about, which includes this wedding ring that was in Major Briggs' stomach. And it said, uh, of course, Dougie's wedding ring. To Dougie. With love, Janie E. And then we get to, oh my God, moment number one. <laughs> when Diane says, oh my God, my sister's name is Jane. Half sister. Half sister. And she's married to a man named Douglas Jones. And everyone calls him Dougie. Dougie Jones. And my sister's nickname is Janie E. So then the agents want to know where, 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 where was the last, you know, do you know where they live? She <laughs> said, last I heard, Las Vegas. They haven't asked yet. Right. And that was the question. They where haven't they asked live? yet. Well, she answered. She answered. If she's on the side of bad, she's wanting these guys to get to Las Vegas. One of my original thoughts was that Janie E was manufactured. That oh, I, my original thought was that it was the girl from a Hall and Drive, and she's an actress playing the part of a wife. Right now, I'm thinking it might be more to to this. So you think half sister means she was made from Diane? She's a product of Diane. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking Diane is. I'm leaning more towards evil now than I was before. Because unless she's got, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. She's on the side of good. I'm still very. Confident. I want to believe. <laughs> there has to be something with the stepping on the butterfly effect of why she can't just say, "Hey, let's go to Las Vegas." Well, they haven't asked me about the ring, so I can't mention Las Vegas or point them in the right direction until they point me in the right direction. Yeah, it's strange. She's definitely keeping what she knows from them. And I believe it's because she doesn't trust what they're doing. Everyone who's under their observations are missing. Her friend Cooper went missing because of these idiots. So uh, she's finding her information to help people that know better. Philip Jeffries and or Judy. Because he's getting his information from Mike, the one our man. So I believe Diane's... Working for good. This is going to get proven. Watch. I'll show you. Okay, so, yeah, we're not quite sure about why Diane doesn't know that Dougie looks a lot like Cooper. She doesn't say anything, but she says she is estranged from her sister, and they haven't seen each other in years. She said she hates her. So She probably never met him. Yeah, she may not have ever even met him or seen a picture of him. She doesn't get a Christmas card from the Joneses. With Sonny Jim on Santa's lap. So, Bob Santa. <laughs> so then so then Cole says, Well, we have to get a hold of the Las Vegas FBI. So she he puts Tammy to work again, like she's a secretary. And she calls Las Vegas FBI and there's this crazy guy there named Edley. And another <laughs> fellow named Wilson comes in and says we got a call from Director Gordon Cole, and Edley gets all nervous, and he picks up the phone, and Cole, and the FBI's goofy way of not doing anything right, <laughs> says, I need you to find a Douglas Jones in your fair city. Let us know all about him, and 
there's two people and they're wanted for murder and proceed with caution because they're right, right. armed. And he forgets to tell them what the damn wife's name is. I mean, really? And you could have Googled it from Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now you got you 23 did, Douglas Joneses. If you just have looking for Douglas Jones and Janie E, search over. Okay, I'll get back to you in five minutes. And he hangs up and it's like, oh, oh God, we have 23 Douglas Joneses in the greater metropolitan area. And this poor guy, Wilson, says, well, uh, how are we going to find the right one? And Headley slams his fist down on the table. Well, said, how many times have I told you that is what we do in the FBI? <laughs> FBI! They'll just hire you off the street and they expect you to learn it all as you go, right? Just hilarious. This I is what we do. Oh, man. <laughs> but, I mean, the whole point of searching through 23, even just 23, Douglas Jones, is pointless if Cole would have done the right thing. Or if the writers want to, we have, right. we have to make this last four more hours. <laughs> so after that, Cole says, thank you, Diane, and that's her cue to get up and leave. And then they have a, a further conversation. Cole tells Albert and Tammy, before I came up here, I uh, talked to Sheriff Truman of Twin Peaks. And they're on to something up there with Laura Palmer's diary, and it's in, it's insinuating there's two coups. And then he recalls a dream he had had last night, and it was another Monica Bellucci dream. Oh boy! And Albert says, "Oh boy!" So maybe they've heard of these Monica Bellucci dreams before, but this is. This is Cole's dream, and it's great because Cooper had dreams, and we're supposed to pay attention to all of it. And it's in black and white, which was what Rancho Rosa sign was at the beginning of the episode, black and white. So I kind of had a feeling we were gonna, either going to go back in time, or we were going to see the White Lodge, what I like to call the White Lodge. But uh, Cole's dream's in black and white, too, so this is great. He's in Paris. I love you. And Monica calls him because Monica Bell Bellucci calls Cole all the time and says, we have to meet at a certain cafe. So they meet at a cafe in Paris and Monica Bellucci's brought a couple of friends with her and they all sit down and have a coffee. Now Cole says he sees Cooper there, but he can't see his face. <laughs> so then they're having this coffee and Monica Bellucci says the, uh, ancient words we are like the dreamer who dreams and then lives inside the dream <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, she asks but who is the dreamer <laughs> and then Cole says all of a sudden in the dream I had a powerful, uneasy feeling. And he says that Monica looks past him to something going on behind him and motions for him to look. So he turns and looks. And all of a sudden he's seeing the past. He sees himself as a young man. I saw myself. I saw myself from long ago. <laughs> and it's a scene from Fire Walk With Me. A very famous scene where Philip Jeffries appears. And uh, in the in the dream, Cole's dreaming that he remembers this. He remembers Cooper coming in and saying that he had had a dream, and he was worried about that day and that time. And then Philip Jeffries appeared, or apparently appeared, and Jeffries raises his arm and points at Cooper and says, "Do you know who this is here?" Do you know who that is there? <laughs> and but you know that, I, that that one feels like an outtake. Might not have been on the missing pieces. Yeah, but it was it's the missing not, pieces version. It is. It is. You yeah. can tell it's slightly different than the movie version. Right. Yeah. Who do you think that this is, is there? Is, right. Yeah. Yeah. When we get David Bowie, ask Philip Jeffries. So we might meet a Philip Jeffries that's not David Bowie, and that's not Philip Jeffries. That's right. 
because we know now Philip Jeffries is David Bowie. Bowie. That's right. So then, you know, it's like Cole's remembering the dream he had last night. And in the dream, he remembers something that happened in his life. And it shocks him. He's like, damn, I hadn't remembered that. And it registered to Albert as well. Right. Now, this is something to think about. And Albert says, I'm beginning to remember that, too. So. You should. We, You're Philip Jeffries, Albert. <laughs> we get more of this later on when uh, the sheriff's department can't remember what had just happened. And we got this all the time. With, with the Diane woodsman. and the woodsman. Right. No one's saying anything. Ray didn't get up and run. Uh, Cynthia Knox didn't say anything about the woodsman. And then uh, when Cole went into the vortex or was almost sucked into the vortex, it's later on that he's remembering seeing the woodsman. It's later on that he starts to remember, oh, now I remember dirty bearded men in a room. He saw that in the vortex. So there's a lot of misplaced memory and a bunch of dirty bearded men in Sarah's kitchen <laughs> but more on that later oh yeah they're inside her mind they're inside her body I had written down something about Cole a lot of people think Gordon Cole knows more than he's letting in on and I think it's more of like that uh, the offices in Philadelphia where Cooper and Albert were having a conversation. Tell me more about her. She's blonde. She's using drugs. She's in high school. She's crying out for help. What is she doing right now? She's making a great abundance of food. So it's. I think Cole has got those kind of abilities where he, he knows what's going on, but he's not able to do anything about it. Right. I don't think he's holding back. There'd be no point in mentioning things like that scene right. in Fire Walk With Me with Cooper and Albert. It, Cooper had these abilities and I, I just think Cole is just like that. He's, he's a seer. He's a seer like that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were going to be picked to work for the FBI and investigate these cases, they would want psychics. They would want people who can astral project, especially the military, the Air Force too, I guess. More so, on that later as well. So, yeah, the, this, is a, this is a big deal and I think Cole is probably a seer, just like Cooper. But the FBI! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we hit on all of that. That was uh, the last scene in South Dakota. That's all I got. That's the all rest I of this, got. The rest of this incredible episode takes place in Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. We start off in the sheriff's station, and <laughs> Andy and Hawk and Bobby and the sheriff are going to the conference room, and they're bringing Chad with them. They're bringing their lunch, too. We don't eat. Right. First they, of yeah. all, they spread out their lunch to show Chad that we're going to do whatever we want in the conference this room. This is our conference room. We eat. Donuts in here, coffee. Oh, and, yeah? And brushing them off. Truman was telling them, oh, this is from a, a long time ago. You don't have to worry yourself about it. And we eat like, boys in here, too. Chats <laughs> all like, who are you guys going? And Paul, oh, oh. And look, when you watch the scene, Truman grabs his handcuffs before he even walks in, and Truman gives the nod to Hawk. So uh, Hawk knows it's down. And then Chad's there. Where are you guys going? Hawk draws the gun. We're going up the mountain. Up the mountain. And I thought baby. he was going to say, but you're going down the river. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby, quick as, quick as a fox, grabs the gun from Chad. And there's Truman cuffing him up. Poor Chad's like, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> what's going on? No, you know what's going on. You know what's going on. They're not going to tell us what's going on. We're not going to see any of this go down. And instead, we've been watching you for months, which would indicate it's the drug ring. It, it wouldn't, right. you know, it wouldn't be the letter that he just received. But that was obstruction of justice. That was covering up a murder. If they've made enough connections there, that would be a reason to go ahead and arrest him. Now you've got the proof. Right. You might need, they might not have had concrete proof before. over the months. And right. They would have busted him a long time ago. Because he's a shady guy. And the way he was talking about the sheriff and his wife and their kid, 
would make me want to fire his ass anyway. But you can't really lock him up with that either. So this is the thing. I, hopefully they'll tell us, but I think it's the envelope. I think they, they have the proof. I was kind of hoping that Chad would go to reach for it. Like, how did they know if he'd actually have the wrong envelope on him? <laughs> or they find it on him? Or they reach in there. But I love how they're bringing him to the back and Chad says something and Bobby says, shut up, Chad. <laughs> That was the first real indication that, yeah, Bobby has nothing to do with this drug ring at all, you know, and he's been kind of wanting to get at Chad for a long time as well, but probably been eating at him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people at the beginning weren't sure whether Truman was completely devoted to the old school guys because he has this crew of new guys in the back. Well, Truman kind of brushed off Chad from the beginning and looks like, looks like Truman's posse is the old posse. And, I'm so interested in what the four boxes were that Andy was laying well, out. Well, that was going to be the lunch boxes, and they were going to put the lunches in the lunch boxes. Okay. I'm assuming. Okay. So, <laughs> so who got what sandwich? Okay. So roast beef and cheese went to Truman. The cheese only sandwich went to Andy. So the last two we have are turkey and cheese, and ham and cheese. So which one did Bobby get? And which one did Hawk get? These are the questions that keep us up at night. You're never going to solve this. It's turkey. I think Hawk got the turkey. Hawk got the turkey. Yeah. Bobby's the ham. Yeah. Uh, Sarah. And that's poor boys, man. That's poor boys. That's not Subway. <laughs> it's poor boys. <laughs> oh, sloppy roast beef. That's what I would get. Oh. Right. We get this amazing drone shot of the woods, and I'm hoping we're going to take a trip in the woods now that we've set it up, you know, with Putting Chad away is great, but uh, let's go on this trip now. We've been waiting five episodes now for it, and so here we go. Sure enough, they pull up, they get out, they grab the backpacks, and they're walking in the woods. We're taking a walk in the woods. This is Twin Peaks, classic Twin Peaks. Some of the establishing shot, well, some of the Showtime trailer shots that you see, Twin Peaks coming up, and a couple of those shots were in, in, included in this walk in the woods that we have. But that, but but every shoot. No one shoots woods like Lynch. It was a long walk, but, but every shot was beautiful. And But that's and true. We didn't get quite in the woods yet as, as far as yeah. right off the road. Yeah. yeah, Bobby shows them a road. It used to be a road, but it's a, but it's a dirt, and they're walking down it. And he said that uh, his dad's listening station was close by. There's hardly anything left of it. They've all come. They've gotten all of it. We're assuming the Air Force. Cleared, cleaned it all up. And Bobby's been in there a few times when he was a kid, but he doesn't remember anything. He just remembers a ton and ton of machines. And then he shows them Jack Rabbit's Palace. It's a big tree stump. But there's lots of trees everywhere, and it's just on a slope, and you get out there at 12 years old with some action figures, and you'd be out there all day having a blast. Well, apparently this is where Bobby and his father would tell stories and it looked like a great place. Now, when the camera goes towards the stump and starts at the bottom of the stump and works its way up, it reminds us of the tower that's outside in the Purple Ocean, which I like to call the White Lodge, is what I think that tower is, the White Lodge. So, Yeah, they both have the same shape. Like a slope up into the top. So then they decide, okay, Hawk's got the little compass or whatever, we're going to go 253 yards due east, and Andy reminds everyone, make sure you put some soil in your pockets. Yeah, good job, Andy. Yeah, Andy was Man, I almost forgot. <laughs> put a little <laughs> soil in my pocket <laughs> from the stump, jackrabbits live in stumps. And Bobby tells them before they leave, uh, his father always told him not to go out there alone without his father. And wander around. Now uh, we're about to find out why. <laughs> because they take that trip, and it's another long trip, and it's 253 yards, and then when they get there, it's one of those classic Lynch visions. Smoke, flashes of light, like electricity. You hear the zzz. You're coming into the smoke, and revealed within the smoke is the, this woman laying there naked, and this pool of liquid eerily similar to the entrance to Glastonbury Grove. Not the same color. No, it was gold. 
So they walk up, approach the woman, Andy shows concern to bend down and to attend to her, and we find out that this is Nido, the Alice woman from the Moivre room. <laughs> It's not Josie. I doubt if it's Josie's sister. But here she is in reality on our earth. And she's laying there. So presumably when she was thrown from the cube in space and fell through space, that she entered earth here. And it, I guess it might have been the same day because when Coop goes back in that room, the watch says Saturday the 1st. And then, bam, here we are, October 1st, and there's... She might have popped up at 2.53 a.m. on the 1st. Yeah, no joke. If they were going on 2.53 on October 1st, why weren't they out there at 2.53 in the morning? Maybe they'll show us that next episode. Maybe so, because military time, it would have been... Um, <laughs> we're not going on military 12, time. 14, it would have been 14-something. 14.50. <laughs> That's no military time. But yeah, it, it, it begs it begs the question if Cooper would have done what she did, then he would have been laying there. But yeah, why? I, I'm not understanding. The, well, he went into a whole other socket after he went back in. Socket. Right. But I thought I thought well, if we just nosedive into space right now and find right. out what happened. Go after her. I thought, yeah, I thought he might have thrown off that cube. It's interesting how long she's been there. You know, if, if she's because we can't tell if she's like. Cooper coming out of the lodge and being incoherent. We can't tell if she's incoherent because she was talking like, like that, that to begin with. So it, it's well, hard to tell. She, she didn't pop out at 2.53 because they get there first. Yeah, they Andy's there sending first. to her and then Truman with that classic line, it's 2.53, fellas. <laughs> I had an alarm set on my watch. Boy, they cut it just in the nick of time, too. Yeah, but, they did. Uh, 2.53 and then all of a sudden a vortex appears above them. All of them can see it. The lights are flashing. And I'm immediately start looking at this group of guys. Okay, you've got Truman, you've got Andy, you've got Bobby, you've got Hawk. All these guys are good, they're strong, their purpose is for love in this moment. So uh, if this is a lodge, maybe we'll get somewhere good. Because I always thought it was how you entered into it, whether it was with fear or with love. And then looking at all of these guys, Bobby's got some demons. Hawk would seem ideal, but he would think crossing over would be foolish. And Correct, which is why I call him the cowardly lion in this <laughs> Wizard of Oz scenario that Lynch loves to do. I've always thought, why, why didn't he just do it? And it's like, well, he knows better. That's yeah. why he doesn't do it. Hawk is smart enough. He would say, going into that other world is foolish. Foolish. You wouldn't. You're not supposed to do that. Then we come to the world. Then we come to the fool. <laughs> yeah. Then we come to. Well, Truman. The Truman King. has a lot of questions too. We don't know really a lot about Frank's background, but we come to the fool, the actual fool who finds the Holy Grail. Andy, who who's naive. Andy doesn't have any uh, uh, preconceived notion about what to expect there, and he probably doesn't have as many demons to encounter. No doubts. It was just it would just be a, a curiosity, much like Cooper, only Cooper had a lot of skeletons in the closet. But yeah, Andy is there tending to Nido. He lets her hand go, he stands up and then he disappears. And boom! He's in the black and white room. Which and, and if you see, it's him actually leaving the chair right. when he saps into the chair. It's, it's backwards. Oh man, great. This is the White Lodge to me. And then the giant shows up. Then this is surreal to me. At yeah. this point, Andy. Right. In that chair. Unbelievable. Of all people. How's he going to manage this? How is he going to retain the knowledge? How is this going to work? And his was probably the cleanest soul to get in that chair first and foremost out of all of them. So he's given the position. And the giant tells him, I am the fireman. Holds his hands up, his one hand up. And you heard the fireman theme in episode eight, right? When Laura Palmer, when the uh, yeah. the fireman ascended, and the Laura Palmer ball came out his head. That that music playing was called the fireman, right? 
And I'm going to probably call him the giant for the rest of my life. I will. I'll keep accidentally doing it. Just like I keep saying cha- uh, episodes instead of parts mm-hmm. or chapters because they aren't episodes. Yeah, they're one hour parts, but they're being shown as one hour episodes on a television show. So, you know. And now we get, we get instead of question marks, we get Fireman in the credits. So, yeah. He's officially the fireman, there to put out fires that are set by evildoers. That's right. We've got that. We figured that out. So then all of a sudden, when the giant puts his hand down, Andy's holding a box. And it's funny how his hands went up here, just like Big Ed's from the end of the last episode, where Ed was holding the suit, and then his hands were down. Andy's hands were down, and he's holding this thing that looks like a box except it's a weird shape and it's got like a little straw sticking out of it and all of a sudden smoke starts to appear and Ooka. Andy looks up and there's like this big looking glass and it's almost like the giant had the theater so he gave uh, Andy the, the personal theater you know this is like the telephone instead of the actual TV right so he can see what happened so then Andy gets a <laughs> Andy gets his personalized view of everything that's happened in part eight <laughs> Whoa! He watches episode eight. You're plugged in like the Matrix. Yeah, and he's downloading all this information. So I wrote everything down because you have to. First, he sees the experiment model, which some people want to call mother. <coughs> then he sees the experiment, which some people want to call mother, spewing out all the evil, which included eggs and the Bob Ball, <coughs> which Andy gets a clear view of. There's your cream corn planet. There's your cream corn (laughs) vomit in outer space. Then uh, Andy sees the gas station. Then Andy sees the woodsman around the gas station. Then Andy sees the particular woodsman who asks Spotlight, the leader of the pack, Abe Lincoln. And then Andy sees what I think is electrical wires, but it's really dark, and he hears the electrical sounds. It could be a distorted view of the stairs leading to the convenience store or Sarah Palmer's house, but it looked like electrical wires to me. Well, we heard electrical sounds too. Then we see the girl running from the pilot in Twin Peaks. Uh, after finding out Laura died, she's running through the school screaming. We see that. And that's when it turns to color. That image goes from black and white to color. Then we see the red drapes. And then Laura's homecoming picture appears with an angel on both sides. And the red curtains continue. Then we see Nido, who's laying where they found her outside of Jack Rabbit's palace. Laura and Nido. Then we see Cooper split into two. One side Coop, one side Mr. C. Then Andy sees a phone ringing. And I don't know if that's the call Truman got earlier in the episode, or if this is a call that hasn't been received yet. And then we see... Andy leading Lucy down a hallway. It appears to be the sheriff's station. And he brings her to a spot where he's kind of positioning her so she can see something. And she has this terrified look on her face as Andy walks away. And then Andy sees a vision of himself holding Nido's hand and Nido trying to talk to him. And in the last image he sees seems to frighten him, and it's the light pole that's at the intersection in Twin Peaks, which originally we saw at in the Fat Trout trailer, trailer Park in Deer Meadow, but now we see at the intersection of Twin Peaks. Telephone gets around. Yeah, so this number six telephone pole, or electrical pole. I think there's three of them, six, six, six. <laughs> and we saw three different images of them, and each image got more and more color. And the last image was in color. So, uh, I guess we're going to meet the pole again. After that, I have some interpretations, but just the order of events. He was being shown everything and just having Laura and then seeing 
I want to say Dido all the time instead of NATO. No, yeah, NATO, NATO. NATO. We're, I'm going NATO or NATO. You guys know what we mean. Just it just seems. Uh, I think there's a connection there. Okay. I think that could be like Laura when she flew out when we saw her fly out of the lodge. Uh -huh. Then Coop went and did everything. I know it took a long time before Nido actually got blown off the power station or whatever you want to call it. But it, it could be like she hitched a ride maybe with her. Laura? Yeah. So, so, that now, so now we have the good Laura because we've been kind of waiting for the... And she's important. People are trying to kill her. I don't know why anyone would even... But anyway, 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 I just wanted to touch on the uh, series of events. And it scares me with Lucy. That's the only vision that Andy had, which could probably be the only uh, bit of negativity in Andy, doubt in Andy, would be, you know, stuff that happened with Lucy. But this hadn't happened yet, I don't think. I think he was being shown something that's going to happen in the future. And when it happens... It'll confirm everything for him, I guess. I, I'm assuming perhaps he's showing her the truth about their real son. Mm. Mm. I don't know. That's that's the one of all those visions. That's the one that I'm worried about. Okay. So all the smoke that's around Andy gets sucked back up into the tube, into the box. Then the box disappears, and Andy shakes, and then he disappears. We get back to real life. He was we're, going backwards. We're at 253 yards uh, backwards the other way. We're back at Jack Rabbit's Palace, and we're seeing all of the deputies arrive. And they arrive in threes, uh, three different images, and all of them are coming from three different places. The sheriff comes to the same spot, but he comes from three different places, and Hawk and Bobby. And they all do that. Then we see Andy carrying NATO, but he comes from the same spot. All and three of his. All three of his are on the same timeline, and he knows everything that's going on. He says uh, she's very important. We have to protect her because people want to kill her. Well, we need to put her in a jail cell where she'll be safe, which is scary because I think of the woodsman and Hastings, <laughs> and. And he says that we can't tell anybody about this. And the sheriff's all on board, okay, because once Andy starts leading them back down the mountain, the sheriff and Hawk are like, do you remember what happened? And Hawk's like, no, I know something happened, but I don't remember it. Right, and we didn't we didn't see Bobby in that shot. So yeah, Bobby, Hawk doesn't remember, Frank doesn't remember. You can only assume Bobby doesn't yeah, remember. I'm assuming Bobby But doesn't. there was no edit, no cut to Bobby. and no, Bobby doesn't remember. He's not gonna remember either. He came from three different spots too. I think it's like it's like they don't remember because there were three different you know little paths that they uh, that they took to get to that spot, and so they're only remembering fragments. I don't know. It's kind of just the way it appeared to me. It's imagery, but Andy sure did show up in the same spot from the same direction, and he knew everything that was happening. So it would make sense in Twin Peaks because everything keeps being a little. Different. We just got to get it all together. Get them all into one. And Andy is the one. He is the hero of the day. Andy's showing some moxie. He's showing some oomph. And he's carrying that woman down the mountain. I mean, well, I got here. tired looking at him. And, you know, he's probably 67 years old. I don't do know. I have to do everything? <laughs> so then they finally get down the mountain. It's nighttime, and we're back at the station. Lucy's given uh, NATO some clothes, and they're putting her in a jail cell. Andy's very caring, and Chad from his jail cell starts yelling at Andy, saying he's no cop. And Andy does what you predicted he would do. He walked right up to Chad and said, Chad, you are a very bad person. You give good cops a bad name. And Lucy is so, so proud. proud. That's her <laughs> man. I don't like the way you talk about Sheriff Truman or anyone else. Agent <laughs> Rosenflower. <laughs> you just shut your mouth. Classic Andy, right? But you know, but he, he's still showing that that uh, effort, that maturity. He's he's firm now in his beliefs. All that stuff's downloaded in him now. She used that. She. <laughs> 
Lucy, Lucy used that robe on a like when they had that lost dogs. <laughs> I mean, you, I know. So it's well, gotta smell like yeah, dogs. Right. Why did they say that? That's that's lit. This it's a, been in here. It, well, I mean, the zoo's about it, the nut house zoo downstairs is about to start. Oh, so yeah, it's like right. uh, we got the smell of dog going on too. I mean, Lynch wants to hit you at with all the senses. There's a drunk that's in there that they have locked up. The only person that was locked up besides Chad and now uh, Nido's down there. But this drunk is repeating everything that's being said. And Chad's really aggravated. No, I predicted this. I wanted Chad to get arrested and have to deal with the people he had arrested. So here he is in jail suffering because of the other prisoners. And it's unlike anything that I could have predicted. This guy's repeating everything, and so NATO is making these sounds. At first, it sounds like a dolphin, or a monkey, or a glass cleaner, and this drunk's repeating it, and it's driving Chad crazy, and he's yelling and screaming, but it doesn't matter. Now, the drunk has cubes in his nose, much like uh, Beverly's husband, but he's got hair, so I figured it was Beverly's husband, right? And he's got a wound on the side of his face, and the wound's bleeding. And then he's just slobbering gross stuff out of his mouth. It looks a little like blood, but it also just looks like a bunch of slobber. It's like engine oil. And and he's credited as a drunk. So I'm not going to assume this is Billy. He wasn't bleeding from the nose, so I don't think it's Billy. He's just a drunk, and he's just a weirdo, and he's just repeating everything, because in Twin Peaks there's parallels, and even, you know, it's Twin Peaks. Man. See, I think, I think I, I, I didn't subscribe to the Billy thing, especially because it's not the same actor that played who we think is Billy. But I, I do think that thing in the jail cell is co somehow connected to, um, to place. Yeah, I mean, it's just not a poison child from the exorcist in a car. I, I think I think um, something's going to pop out of this drunk Ooh. <laughs> and and. We're going to have a screaming Chad and a blind NATO having to deal with something down here. Oh, that's like the thing, right? Where they locked him up with oh, dogs. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But all these animal noises and the squeaking, and it did sound like a dolphin. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it, you know, harkens back to the... <laughs> right, exactly. Just yeah. the madness down there. Paying homage. And plus, making Chad suffer. Yeah, he's, he's, just, he's a criminal, which is what he is, and he's got to deal with this this element. And I think he did call it a nut house because I mean they mentioned nut house later on in the episode. <laughs> it's just a, you know lynching his duality there. He's going to throw that word in there. Uh, we stay in Twin Peaks. We're going to the Great Northern Hotel, and we see that awesome night shot again. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so we're going to see uh, we're going to see Ben. But no, we, we don't see Ben. We go around the building to the security guards, the Great Northern Hotel security guards. And this is James Hurley and his friend Freddie. Freddie Sykes. Freddie Sykes. This is the kid with the green glove that showed up in episode two at the end of part two. He walked into the roadhouse with James and it seemed to be his first time there. And he thought it was the dog's books. The dog's books. So... They're sitting there talking. Uh, Freddie's trying to crack walnuts, and he's using his gloved hand. And he's just using two fingers, and he's just obliterating these nuts in the dust. It's not working, so James helps him out. And Freddy, With a nutcracker that Freddie could have used. But anyway, I digress. And then uh, Freddie keeps calling James Jimmy. So, Jimmy! We've got a Jimmy now. And, uh... What DJ name is Jimmy? <laughs> it is now, or what? Jimmy Keaton. Oh, it is now. It is. That's my on-air name when I'm on air. Not Beaver, not my club name. That's my club name. So James says, you know, one more delivery and then we're out of here. We're going to go to the roadhouse. Uh, Freddie says, uh, who do you think's playing tonight? And James says, I don't know. And I'm hoping, oh, come on. You know, James Hurley. You know, that's a great gig. Yeah. They don't know who's playing. But it made me think Freddie'd been there before. You Freddie, want to go see that girl Renee. Freddie says, You want to go see that girl Renee? And James like, Well maybe and then Freddie says, Well don't you know she's married? 
Oi there, Evelyn. Uh, I mean, it's Twin Peaks, Evelyn. Oh, and James is like, you think I care about married women? <laughs> They're all been there, done that. They usually off themselves or get killed when I'm done with them. I know, poor James, man. I didn't do it. I'm going to assume Donna died in the motorcycle accident. You also got James laying his lips on Maddie, and then she died. James was with Laura, and she died. James was with Evelyn, and she got arrested for murder. This guy's bad luck. He sucked his tailpipe of his bike. His bike would die. <laughs> so, so uh, Freddy's his friend, though. He's taking Freddy under his wing. He tells Freddy, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. But he really wants to know about the glove. By the way, Freddy is uh, almost 23 years old. Just as many number of Douglas Jones as there are in Met Metropolitan and Las Vegas area. 23. Two 23s. Yeah. <laughs> the number 23. This day happens to be James Hurley's birthday, which is pretty good news. Mm -hmm. so Unless you look at the secret history of Twin Peaks, <laughs> then you see it's something different. Probably. I can't confirm that. So then, James asks about the glove, and Freddie says he can't really tell the story, but he did tell the doctor, and James is like, it's my birthday, and I'm not going to tell anyone, you can trust me, and Freddie's like, well, you're not going to believe me anyway, but here's the story, and then we get story time again, and Freddie tells the long story about uh, how he lived in London town about six months ago, he was on a night out with his pals at the pub with his mates. We call them partners. Yeah, we call them partners down here. And uh, he's walking home from the pubs. He's alone. He goes down an alleyway and he has this overwhelming feeling that he's wasting his time. You know, he's spending all his time he's tossing off. He's pissing it away. In pubs and pissing his life away. Instead of uh, taking care of people, which is what he feels like he should be doing. I should be taking care of people. Ooh. Now, there's that, there's that, um, good, the love that opens the, the key, the right, the right lodge. And he says it very specifically, and, and I wrote it down. He said, feeling this way, meaning wanting to take care of people, feeling this way on this particular night. I see some boxes stacked up and I decide to jump on top and then all of a sudden I'm in a vortex. So, you know, he's letting you know that with the right feeling and you go to the right place and location at the right time and you'll go to this place, which is he ends up seeing the fireman. He's floating in there and next thing you know, he's in a room and this bloke shows up and calls himself the fireman. And he tells me he needs to go to the department store, the hardware store that's right next to his flat. You call them apartments here. Yeah. And buy uh, buy a pack a pair of gloves. Green gloves. The rubber gloves. Open pack. But it's an open pack and it's only gonna have one right glove in it. Buy that. But I'm left handed, mate. <laughs> and then uh, that's it. Uh, he told them when he wears the glove, he'll have it'll have the power of an enormous power driver. So then he wakes up, and he recalls other stuff from the dream later in classic Lynch style. But that's all he remembers. He wakes up, he decides to go to the store. Sure enough, the hardware store had the open pack with one green glove. He tries to purchase it and tells us the long, long story about the job's worth being obstructive. So then he puts the money down, the beans, I think he said, and he grabs the glove and he hits the pavement, or what did he say? The Okay, and he's running, and then this guy tackles him like he wants to get a red car in the soccer. Oh, man, it's so many English. <laughs> I want to do the American version. Yeah. I'll take his whole monologue yeah. and just do the so, American so version. So Jobworth tackles him before he crosses the line of scrimmage. Do the ghetto version. We need to do the redneck version. We need to do the Yankee version. And uh, instinctively, uh, uh, Freddy decides, I punched him. Boom. And he heard a crack, and the way his jaw moved as he tried to speak, he knew that he had broke his Gregory. <laughs> okay. That's, that's broke his jaw. I'm assuming he broke his jaw, and in the comments you can tell me what Gregory and all that means. So, uh, his head or spine. And at that point, after he realized he could crack skulls, 
he remembered that the giant had told him, hey, you need to get the glove on, and you need to go to Twin Peaks, Washington, United States of America, and there you will figure out your destiny. It doesn't exist, actually, but... So then he... That's how he got there, on that fine birthday, birthday of James Jimmy Hurley. And this is a two vortexes now, and they both seem to go to the White Lodge mm -hmm. that we learned about. And we also, uh, there was a plane ticket already purchased for him. Right. When he went to buy the ticket, it was already purchased. Somebody knew he was going to be there. Or he did it himself in, in an alternate timeline. <laughs> we really don't know. Whoa. I mean, the White Lodge is buying plane tickets now. Now, well, Lois Duffy. I thought Lois Griffin and Duff Beer. <laughs> it's just how <laughs> we're always looking for a tip of the hats, you know? Maybe he was a fan of Patrick Duffy. Maybe he Lynch watched Dallas back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so James loves this story. I mean, it's almost as cool as he is. Jimmy. And he, Jimmy's like, wow, man, thanks for telling me the story. He's like, oh, the pleasure's all mine. And then he says, well, you go, you know, we have to check the furnace. And James, Jimmy says, well, yeah, I'll go check the furnace. You wait for the last one. Don't forget to sign. And then Jimmy gets up and goes into what looks like a big boiler room looking for the furnace. And as soon as he gets in there, we hear the same sound from Beverly's office that's inside the Great Northern, and it sounds really loud where James is at. It's tenfold. So he's wandering around, and he's looking, and he comes upon a door. And that's that. And that's that. That hallway actually looked to me like when you see Cooper in the for one of the first trailers and he's walking and then you brighten it up you see it's the one arm man walking with him. But so you think it looks I, like it, that? It, it, I have to go back and look at it, but it's it kind does, of similar. It does harken back to the international pilot where you had the, the, the entire dream sequence in the basement of Oh finding Bob hospital. down in the Yeah. But it also reminded me of Nightmare on Elm Street because it's like a boiler room kind of deal. They had a Freddy. Pretty freaky, and they did have a friend who and was wearing a good There's gun. been lots of nods to gangster films and Quentin Tarantino, and you kind of Stanley Kubrick, you see kind of Lynch's nods, and maybe with the green glove, maybe a nod to the comic book uh, genre mm -hmm, that's going cast. on. I Man, that would be so great to have a comic book ending. Uh, uh, and Nadine there, too, because she's well, always been super powerful. Funny you should Lynch's say that, because now we have Freddie Sykes, Bushnell. Yep, of course, monster. Super Cooper. Super Cooper. Super Cooper. Super, super, super. And Nadine and her golden shovel. Oh, my goodness. She could take some heads off if she swung that thing. I mean, <laughs> do you like that sound effect? Yeah, I'm looking. I want to see this go down. <laughs> Gladiator style, comic there, book style. There was also an homage paid to the Beatles when Freddie was telling his story and he said, woke up, got out of bed, dragged home across my head. <laughs> <laughs> Went downstairs and drank a cup. No, looking I'm just joking up, about that one. I noticed I was late. <laughs> and the second Beatles reference that I saw was in the next scene when Sarah Palmer is going to a place called Elks Point, number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. It's so funny because Sarah walking down the sidewalk, she almost looked like Laura for a second. And I'm like, this is really weird. It's just the image and then. Sarah gets in there. I don't know if she frequents this place or not, but she gets a seat. She orders a Bloody Mary. The bartender goes to get it for her. And there's this other guy sitting there. And he's wearing a tr Truck U shirt. Truck U, man! And he keeps looking at Sarah. Sarah gets her drink. And then he approaches Sarah, and he starts acting like a real douche. Uh, he asks why she's drinking alone. And she says... You know, don't bother me. He says, that's not polite. She said, I'm not trying to be polite. Then he starts calling her really bad words. And he said, it's a free country. So, our country. Mm. So, he can sit anywhere he wants. And then she, he suggests that she likes to eat well. trees. And then Sarah says, I'll eat you. I'll eat you. And he's like, well, whatever, you know. 
get away. I, I'll pull off your little lesbo titties. And then she turns and faces him. And then we have what is blowing the community's mind. And Sarah removes her face. And inside, it's not a blinding white light like we saw from her daughter Laura in the Black Lodge or in the Red Room. It's darkness in there. There appears a hand. The ring finger, the spiritual mound, is completely black, just dark. Um, and then we get the smile with the black lips. And the whole time this imagery is happening, it shot something out too. When, it first, when she first opened her face, it looked like two little things went ch -ch -ch coming out of it. But it kind of reminded me of when the Dougie ball, remember when the gold ball and then oh, the yeah. black ball kind of went right. a little bit. It kind of reminded me of that when it first opened up. So then uh, we hear a voice that says, do you really want to fuck with this? Is that what it says? Do you really want to fuck with this? And then Sarah puts her face back on. And then she takes a quick bite <laughs> and takes off part of his chin and a huge chunk out of his throat. He's squirting in blood everywhere. He hits the ground. And then we look at Sarah. She has no blood on her at all. And she screams like she's genuinely shocked. She said, I was just sitting here having my drink. You saw me. The bartender's like, did you have anything to do with this? The bartender's freaking out. Yeah, what the hell? frequented that place. He would have been like, Sarah, what's up? And he right. would have known her name. Okay. So then uh, the bartender's like, honey, call 911. We got a dead one at the bar. <laughs> and it looks as though he's not going to let Sarah leave. He wants the cops to show up and question her because she was sitting next to him. Who's left? And Sarah said, uh, they're going to have to send Jesse. Sarah said, sure is a mystery, huh? And that's what the whole community is. The new mystery. The mystery of Sarah Palmer. Now, some people say this changes everything. I don't think this changes everything. If you, if you just got to look at certain things as imagery. So, uh, Laura was revealing to Cooper that inside of her, in that state, was, was pure goodness. And right now, what's possessing Sarah is pure evil. A good word, possess. But, you know, that is a quick move to sit there and bite somebody's a big chunk out of them and not have any blood on you at all. you got to wonder what really happened there. What really killed them. We've been wondering ever since whatever it was that escaped out the glass box, the experiment model. We've been wondering where it went. What is it doing fooling around New York catching cabs? Right, and right. I think, I really do think, I mean... Once again, I'm bunning here, but it looks like we found that thing's destination. Perhaps. At least. Perhaps. Yeah, because doppelgangers don't do soul possessing like Bob does. You right. know, Evil Coop would have never just been able to come out the lodge, I guess, and find a portal and come out the lodge. So it looks like Laura's smile inside Sarah's face, mm -hmm. just an evil. Mm -hmm. So you would think doppelganger or evil Laura. But. I'm going to lean on the experiment more. That's We've been wondering where that thing went. It is out there. So it's a possession of, of Sarah by a, a Black Lodge entity, an yeah. evil entity. And how she managed to bite a big chunk out of him without getting blood all over, I have no idea. The miracle of editing. <laughs> so... Um, that's my opinion of it right now. That was pretty much just imagery that was like revealing what's inside. Not that the human being that is Sarah Palmer can actually remove her face. Right. Perhaps that's what this guy saw in this Black Lodge moment. Now, who do we send? Now. Who does Twin Peaks send to answer the 911 call? Because Chad's in jail. If we're on the right timeline here, Chad's in jail. Um, one of our bookhouse boys, the the twenty first century bookhouse boys. They're all back by now. They can all go. Somebody, well, it'll, be, it'll be it'll be it'll be Jesse. Yeah, here's Jesse something today. You want to come see my new car, Sarah? <laughs> come on, man. I'll, I'll take you home, Sarah. Home. I want to see that damn new car. <laughs> but it's true. It looks like we have this coming up. We have an investigation that's going to have to take place. Sarah's involved now. Mm -hmm. Um. 
what else? Because we do an end in, at night. So we can only assume that it's the night after our boys went to Jack. The night of October 1st. Right. Right. For the for the sheriff's station. So I'm hoping they decide to go back at 253. But, I mean, if right. they didn't remember what was going on. It's the same thing when Gordon found it. Well, it looks like we found one. It's like, well, okay, that's it. You just X marks the spot and move on. Or, <laughs> or, or are we going to... You better put up some yellow tape. Do not cross. Right, right. So... Are we going back here for any reason? I guess Andy has those answers because yeah. I think Andy, Andy knows everything. Yeah, I think Andy would be able to tell them whether they have to go back. Andy would be able to tell them anything they need to know. And as far as the FBI goes, I think Diane knows way more than the rest of them. We should see them on a plane heading to Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Now well, no, we should we should get the entire FBI in Vegas next episode if we want to crash everything into the last three hours, four hours. Yeah. Four hours, so yeah, we should be getting some movement here soon. All of this stuff, not to mention Stephen and Becky, and you know, are we ever going to go back to the glass box and who owns it? And what about Chip? Chip doesn't have a phone. Yeah, we can't call Chip. He ain't got no phone. I mean, well, imagine if we go back and sew up all those <laughs> loose ends in the last four hours. You guys are going to be so mad. I mean, they just gave us Audrey, and then we went an episode without Audrey. Like, come on, man. You waited this long. I thought we were going to get Audrey in every episode, right? And, yeah. and the, the, the last scene we have is it's real important when it comes to Audrey. But yeah, we close in the roadhouse like we so often do. No music playing this time, so it's an enjoyable conversation, mm -hmm. regardless of what they're talking, as long as you yep. can hear them. And We don't know the girls. One of them's Megan, one of them's Sophie. And I believe that was Lynch's wife. Right. Not real life. In real life. In real life. life. Uh, yeah, I don't know which one that was. That was the, Sophie. The one that didn't, the one that wasn't telling the story. The yeah. one that was listening. Yeah. yeah. The one that wasn't Tina's daughter. But I don't know which one's Megan, which one's Sophie. Ina. So, uh, the one that's Tina's daughter, <laughs> I guess her name's Megan, uh, she's talking about getting high in her bedroom. Not at the nut house. The other girl was accusing her of getting high at the nut house. I'm starting to think the nut house is probably a place that uh, Marianne is, you know, where the drugs were, where we were supposed to go a long time ago to pick up the drugs at Marianne's place. I would think that it was just the nut house would be like the crack house. That's what I thought. Mm, really? I thought it was an actual asylum where Audrey was and other people probably. But they don't talk about making thongs in there. I go to the nut house to get high. <laughs> and this girl that's Tina's daughter has a shirt on that she stole from Paula. So we, we, we know right away this younger woman is... Uh, trash she's a thief and she's a drug addict um then the girl that's the other girl that's asking the questions wants to know if she was last time you saw billy we heard you, you were the last person to see billy and she said yeah it was horrifying she said her and her mom and maybe her uncle were in the house and billy showed up and billy jumped a six foot fence to get into the yard he had a crazy look in his face he Bust in the house. He goes to the kitchen. Bleeding from the nose and mouth. Bleeding from the nose and the mouth. He hangs over the sink. The blood's coming down like a waterfall. Then he turns and he looks at him. And then he takes off. This girl said her and her mom screamed. And then she said, you know, I don't... We didn't say anything because we didn't know what to think about it. But uh, it took a long time to clean up the blood. I don't remember right. if my uncle was there. Right. She kept me and my mom cleaned the blood up. But I don't remember if my, my uncle was there. So weird. <laughs> the uncle. Right. And then uh, she admits that her mom and Billy are probably having a, a relationship, an affair. At least they used to. Up until recently, at right. least. And. Then the girl asks, well, what's your mom's name? And I'm thinking she's going to say Audrey, but no, she says Dina. So Dina. now we have the evil music comes in because uh, now we know that Tina's sleeping with the same guy that Audrey was sleeping with, I guess. Now, it brings me back to when we first meet Audrey. She tells a story of having a dream of 
bleeding, Billy bleeding from the nose and mouth, and then we get Charlie getting talking, calling Tina, talking to Tina. What if Tina was telling Charlie this entire story about uh-huh. Billy and he was bleeding from the nose and mouth? And Charlie mm-hmm. would be like, "Really, this is so interesting." And I can't tell you what she you know, probably told her about Richard and everything else. I mean, that who knows what she said. This is why that phone conversation was more important because yeah. now it looks like. If she is in a coma, I mean, if, if it's a real, if it's a real doctor and a real girl who hasn't left the house, knowing things that are happening, oh. Audrey's knowing things that are that he's finding out is actually happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd want to keep a person like like uh, Silence of the Lambs. I mean, that psychiatrist didn't want to lose his prized cow. You know, he wanted to keep him in there. He wanted to benefit from it. So Audrey could be this guy, Charlie's prized cow. This girl sees things. Yeah. Yeah. If she's not Nicole. And if she's not Tina herself. Right. So, yeah. A lot, lots more layers. But at least these two people we never met before were talking about something we've heard of before. So perhaps we'll make some more connections. We've got four hours left. Don't know how much invitational love at the Roadhouse is going to get sewn up. Well, there is Eddie Vedder left to play, and we're hoping to see Julie Cruz, and there's only four episodes left, so I'm hoping to see Eddie Vedder in the next two episodes. And I'm hoping to get at least two performances from Julie Cruz. That's what I'm hoping, that she ends the, the finale, the last two episodes. But uh, Or just, they don't have one at the end of the first hour, they have just her at the end of the second hour. Right. They still they still play Cactus Blossoms at the end of part three, if you watch it as a 3-4 combo. They still play a lot of it. They just didn't run the credits. But um, I'm thinking we're going to see a performance that we've already seen in the Roadhouse in one of these four episodes. And we're going to see something we saw before and realize that it's, uh, oh, that actually happened at this point. Hmm. But So, speaking of musical performances, the one that ended this one by the band named Lizzie, I think? Lizzie! was like, you know, that... That's a good song in another time, in another place, on another show. But Melissa Etheridge, I wasn't feeling that at all. And normally I don't comment on the musical acts for too much. But I have to say, that was the worst song yet, in my opinion. Didn't fit the mood at all. The Wild Wild West doesn't conjure up thoughts of Twin Peaks in my head. So even though it's in, in the West, it just doesn't. So anyway, I hated it. I thought that felt completely flat. Just horrible. I'm going down. That one was okay, too. It grows <laughs> on me. <laughs> Chromatic still number one. Nine Inch Nails, I just won't ever listen to it until I watch the episode, and then I will definitely yeah. listen to it. I'll listen to that one during the episode. Yeah. Even though at the time it was happening, I was pretty pissed. The first viewing, they like, come on. We're watching a four and a half minute five minute Nine Inch Nails video instead of an episode of Twin Peaks. What's going on here? And then we got the greatest episode ever, so. I'm just looking for... So that was it. The credits rolled and we are like the dreamer was over. Great episode. We both gave it 10 out of 10. I just wanted to write down, I wrote New Orleans native Grace Zabriskie, you know. Louisiana proud. Owning it. Making us proud. I mean, every scene she's in, she's dominating and I wrote down Jack Locke because uh, my friend Jack Locke Jack Locke Rock Show played this weekend and he created the Twin Peaks video game oh yeah that little, if you go on YouTube and just type in Twin Peaks video game you'll see it it was worse than E.T. it was for Atari or Nintendo Vision or one of those old games right. but he created it that's how I met the guy we're good friends and he's a Louisiana native too so that's a little Twin Peaks there how you doing Brian Traha and Blake Charles by the way he's another Twin Peaks creation <laughs> love my peeps yep my peeps so that was it this episode was great it speaks for itself there's a lot of stuff that could be pondered and we could discuss the Sarah scene for another 30 minutes. Probably will in thoughts we thought you didn't think of. Yeah, we may bring up something interesting there. So, uh, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, subscribe to Rosenfield 10. That way you'll know when our thoughts 
comes out this week. We're like a couple of shout outs to the community this week. I don't I didn't have anybody in particular to, to mention this week. Oh no. Is there somebody you want to give a shout out to? I uh, Grumpy Andrews Horror House. You haven't done a Twin Peaks review in a while. We love Grumpy Andrew. Yeah, I met him a long time ago through Twin Peaks. He does a lot of horror videos and he's great. I love all his videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys should check out Grumpy Andrew's Horror House. All of his reviews. He does all, all the horror stuff. I mean, everything. Fan Classic. He just did Phantasm recently, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, he ranks all of them. And it's a lot of fun. And he does a horror unboxing every month. So he gets a horror box and he unboxes it and shows you the little gifts he gets. And so he's great. Yeah, so shout out to Grumpy Andrew. That's a good one. Um, subscribe Rose and Bill 10 like the video if you liked it comment if you want to comment don't leave huge long comments full of 50 questions because I'm never going to get to answer all of them but if you do have a serious contradiction you want to address it and then we can have a conversation uh, thanks to the community you guys are great keep it up we're going to suck some stuff out of you and come back later on this week with thoughts we thought you didn't think of. Spit Garmin to see you back out at you. And remember to subscribe so you can get some more videos too. We might be doing another one this week. Grumpy Andrew has uh, 10 simple film questions that he's tagging people on and he knows how much we love lists and answering these favorites. So we're going to tackle those 10 questions in a video this week. So subscribe so you'll know. Click the little bell. Ding. And then you'll know when you can watch this great content, horrible audio video quality. <laughs> I am Joe. I'm James. This has been Twin Peaks Twin Perspective. And that's Josie. <laughs> and, uh, we will see you in the trees. Bye.